coming up now. Welcome back to the SPL Masters. We are now at the halfway point of our day. Our first two sets are complete. We now move in to our second half here with two more best of threes. One more elimination a little bit later on down the road, but now a big qual potential qualifying matchup here for these two squ squads out here. It's JMX Charlie here on the desk to help me out on this set as we jump into the Wargs and Hex Mom. And as I said, we are now jumping ourselves to the winner's side bracket. Now, if I'm not mistaken, winner of this one moves on. They get a jump up and see who gets to play up against some of the SPL town a little bit later on. Loser this one. They drop down a little bit later and they wait for their opposition who will come from a match a little bit later on through. So Nifflein Wargs and Hex Mom a lot on the line for these two teams in their matchup. Chance to move up and face some of that SPL talent. Charlie, I'm very excited for this one. It's a battle not just between the two EU, but the number two and the number three seed squads out of here. Hex Mambo, the number two out of Europe. Nifflein Wargs, number three out of Europe. Both these teams having pretty dominant performances so far. 4-0 and in their two sets. And that is not only a big deal because I think momentum, the first team that takes a loss here is going to be knocked off their, their, their win streak, so to speak, and that can be a big deal playing for the mental, especially you already highlighted so much on the line, just being able to jump in to the next form of the bracket, which is a huge deal. So I would imagine nerves high for the Wargs and the Mambo, of course. Yeah, for both these two teams, it's going to be a very important matchup here. We'll start off by talking a little bit about the Niflheim Wargs, kind of how their week started out here. Uh, great performances by these individuals on the team, and it really feels like there there isn't a whole huge, well, you know, usually we can kind of point to one of the SEC teams and go, okay, that's their standout player on the, this is the one that has been carrying this team, but in all honesty, the whole of the Niflheim Wargs has really stepped it up for this event. They've really been able to kind of find their own throughout this entire thing through. Still, great performances by Rapio and Khan. I think those might be two of the maybe more standout-ish players, at least as far sure. as some of the early game is concerned. But once we hit that late game, the team fight is really where this team brings it together. Yeah, no doubt. I'm, I'm glad that you highlighted Khan and Rapio because I think that they have been the pitcher of consistency. They have been around for a while, been playing together for a bit now, and it's, it's one of those situations where I've really been noticing the improvement, and I think they've been playing on uh, at the top of their game for a situation like this. And then I tend to agree with the rest of your statement as well. The rest of the team has really been stepping up. I think Davey's been pretty consistent as much as you can be in a situation like this where there's a, a lot of kills in this sort of new meta. And I think Davey's been able to hold his own. Uh, the entirety of the works. I've been impressed and I've been really enjoying watching their, let's call it a win streak because that's exactly what it is, right? 4-0 at this point. I've been enjoying the, the gameplay style that they've been putting on for sure. Yeah, we've been seeing, at least out of Gunter, a lot of these Discordia games, it seems that this is one of the mages that has kind of come to the forefront of conversation, not just for EU, we've been seeing a little bit over an A in the North American region as well, but for the EU players, the Discordia, most specifically the Baba Yaga, which more often than not now has been banned away from a lot of players. Sometimes you'll get kind of that game one, Baba Yaga does really good, okay, we don't want to deal with that anymore, banned in game number two, where it feels like... Those are kind of the uh, the head over the rest style of mages that have really emerged in, in these EU teams. And that's what I've been enjoying the most is the, the amount of diversity in picks and bans. It has not been, you know, there's been some picks that of course are going to dominate the meta, but there has been a lot of different style of play. You know, the thing, you know, we're just going to see the jungle match up 1v1s, uh, you know, being able to camp the solo lane, all vi viable strategies so far in this tournament. We've even seen a lot of these junglers sit back and say, hey, maybe we don't get aggressive. Maybe we don't look for that early pressure that we're so used to seeing. We're going to farm till late game and still have that potential to impact the map. And because of that, you never know what to expect. And even though we've seen these teams so far, four different games, uh, they could hold out a completely different strategy here for this actual qualification match. Yeah, I think kind of seeing the EU versus the EU matchup once more here on the upper side of the bracket is really going to give us a nice little show for these two teams out there. And going up against the Wargs is going to be that Hex Mambo roster as well. And I think this is where we we'll really get to kind of see kind of the most impactful bout between these two teams out there. Because remember, the number one seed of Europe, you guys had a couple of subs out there, haven't been able to form up to the same level maybe of expectations out there. But Really, with, with Hex Mabo, Niflheim, Wargs, and again, you know, we highlighted Rapio and Khan. I think it's only right to highlight their opponents on the opposite side who have also been pretty consistent carries for this Mambo team, Julio and Johnny. Johnny specifically, just in the matchups that, that we have seen from him so far, really feels like the mentality of the team is one of two things. Either Johnny's on a late-game carry, we're going to get to 20, 25 minutes, and then let Johnny carry the game, or... Johnny's on an early god, a.k.a. something like Bakasura, and we're just going to hit the gas pedal from minute five. Yeah, I'm not going to say the team lives or dies by Johnny, but he is certainly holding a, a lot of the weight of this squad. He's able to control the momentum pretty well, as you said, either A, 
just riding early saying, hey, I'm going to go for some solid ganks, get one lane ahead, we can play through that. Or saying, hey, everyone sort of farm, we're going to play a little bit passively, you know, a very low kill game. And then I'm going to be able to pop off in the later stages. But Johnny can't get all the credit. I think that Hawk has been having a fantastic performance in mid. As we just saw there, the Baba Yaga is a contested pick between pretty much every mid laner at the moment. And if, as long as you can pilot it and get some good damage off, there's a good threat towards your, your own mid lane matchup and picks and bans, that sort of thing. So I think the entirety of this squad as well deserves that same level of praise. You don't get to this point in the tournament unless everyone's pulling their weight. It's for Hex Mambo. Been very impressed with their performance through. Again, talking, you know, second, third seed between these two teams out here, now having another opportunity to face off against each other here in this bracket matchup. So going to be a big one, and, and I'm very excited to see what this Mambo team has been cooking up, having Deathwalker over here as the coach. We all know what <laughs> Hex Mambo is able to do as a squad, just in general when it comes down to these events. But you always got to wonder, what's in the back of Deathwalker's mind? You know, what, what is he kind of cooking up for his squad here? We saw some of the tier play that he brought out last time, and then we got to see what Julio was able to do on the tier. So you never know what, what Deathwalker's got, at least for the back of his team here, trying to figure out, you know, what kind of plays that they want to go, what kind of strategies. Because right now, I mean, the picks and bans strategy – against Hex Mambo for any team that has faced them so far has been, okay, we'll get our generic stuff, and if Johnny hasn't picked something, we're going to ban out Johnny for the yep. last couple. But that hasn't seemed to have worked just yet, Trelly. So we'll have to see maybe if the Niflheim Wargs have been able to lock something down against Hex Mambo. We get ready to jump into the picks and bans for game number one between the Niflheim Wargs and Hex Mambo. Winner, a guaranteed spot to face off against an SPL opponent, either the Hounds or the Gladiators. Loser. So that's an opportunity to make their run through the lower end of the bracket, though not quite as far back potentially immediately after. And I, I love to see what the Wargs coach or what the Wargs players are throwing up there, showing, hey, we're putting a little bit of respect on Johnny. A Bakasura ban immediately by the Wargs. Yeah, I definitely don't hate it. I think Johnny's been able to control the early game flow of the map pretty well with this pick and a lot of other junglers as well. And because of that, you got to try and limit what Johnny's able to do. If you want to get to a late game ahead or even even, I think trying to limit exactly how much map state Johnny can cover is probably going to be a good look. Followed by the Disco, as we mentioned, probably be a contested pick between both these mid laners and, of course, the tier. And that leaves open a lot. I still do think that Baba Yaga could be a viable first pick, even though it's not this end-all, be-all. Just getting your mid laner on something that's A, comfortable, and B, can farm relatively safe is still very important. With the new map changes, that mid lane's a bit bigger, and because of that, you want to stay pretty far back. And everyone's just there. They're Dude, having a good time. I love, I love the the energy and the and the emotion that we're already seeing out of the wargs. Just in some of these first few bands out there, we do see Bakasura discordian as you highlight tier by the wargs. Mambo take away Yamoja, Horus, and Kamazot. So it's a Baba Yaga first pick by the wargs, and a Hachiman lock in for Mambo. Terra seems to be at least the hover for the team. We're not to be surprised to see if that one gets locked in. But I will say this, Trelly, all of day number one. We saw two bands specifically throughout the day. Haven't really seen that same level of priority towards them. I wonder if we'll get to see them maybe in this set. Erlong, Shin, and Kuzumbo. They were banned all day yesterday. Haven't seen any any side of them just yet. Yep. I do think that those are picks that maybe teams are afraid of. But at this point, meta has come through. They recognize there's bigger threats. Or they just don't think those picks are going to be grabbed. The wargs are going to put some presence. I've been loving Kana. Being able to grab this King Arthur, I think he's been having a fantastic performance on this pick. Usually coupled, of course, with that Discordia passive. Not going to be able to pick it up this time, but still, some great lane pressure. And it's going to be the Kali. Man, we've seen a few Kalis already this weekend, and if you let that late game get online, we've been talking about Johnny in particular, the, these picks go hand in hand. Just let them get to level 20. Johnny said, I'm not letting them triple, quadruple ban me this time through as so he picks up that Kali early alongside Terra and Hachiman. Now we jump into the second wave of bands. We'll see a band of Nox. We saw a little bit of it early on yesterday, but then as the day started progressing, we started seeing less and less of kind of the mage support style of bands. Specifically, the Nox has really been the only one that's kind of been jumping up to the forefront of conversation and throw in there. Got to make sure that if you're playing against Rapio, you ban away one of his signature picks, Thor, taken out by Hex Mambo and Niflheim Wargs. They'll go with a Guan Yu and still one more ban available over towards them. With Tyr and Guan Yu taken away, and now an Agni. wonder what we might see out of the solo lane for Kana. Hercules got to imagine maybe still at least the topic of conversation, but haven't really been seeing him this tournament so far, Trelly. Yeah, it really depends on what Julio wants, and it looks like some safety there for wow. the Wukong. Uh, fearful of ganks, mayhaps, and if that's the case, then hey, you got the Somersault Cloud, you're going to be able to clear just fine. 
Probably not any solo kill potential, but we rarely see that nowadays anyways. So just something that can survive in lane there for Mambo. The Wargs have their opportunity though. I do still think that Rapio would like something that can get aggressive early because you're not going to out late game Kali. It's just too difficult. The Fenrir I know has been a pick that Rapio could go to to try and say, hey, you, you don't have any CC immunity. If you want to get blink early, I'm going to force you just not to be able to do that and try and grab a bead just to make sure that you're safe. It also give Terra a run for their money. Wow. The Aphrodite lock in. Possibly for that immunity, trying to deal with what Kali wants to do. Hey, my target's getting relatively low. Mm. Now they're now they're unkillable. Yes. Warrior Jungle seems to be the name of the game now for the Niflheim Wargs as Rapio locks in an Achilles to go alongside the partner in at least warrior sense of the King Arthur there. So Niflheim Wargs. We've been seeing a little bit of Warrior Jungle in the past, though. It's been a while since we've seen Achilles. I think back to Season 8, maybe early Season 9, we were seeing things like Achilles sometimes kind of pop up its way through there. Obviously, we had the meta with Erlong Shan, Osiris, and the more auto attack style, but it's been a while since we've seen more of the ability style warriors make their way there. How do you kind of feel about the Achilles? You you tend to talk about, you know, when you have the Aphrodite, you want kind of a pocket carry to go along with it. Is Achilles kind of that, that pocket hyper carry that you can have for your team? Hyper carry, no, but he's going to have to fill the role in this composition. It, it, it can work out. There's just a lot of answers to the execute on the side of Mambo here. Kali, simply not going to care, just going to pop that immobility and we're gonna see the Merlin as the last pick still pretty late game slanted right you don't have that much early pressure with the Merlin Kali wants to sit back and farm the only guy that you feel pretty comfortable just sitting around and farming on is going to be your side lanes of course Wukong and Hachiman very safe they've got that CC immunity to disengage and we were talking about you know that that afro and that Achilles combo you're gonna want to look to fight in those side lanes so see if the Wargs are able to Number one, keep their ward vision up so they can go for ganks like that. Number two, see how much damage this Achilles jungle can really dish out. I think when we're talking about Hex Mamba, we mentioned earlier, you kind of have that mo those those two sides of the coin for Hex Mamba. You have the where the five minute powerhouse, we're just gonna start running it down as soon as Ultimate comes online for our team, or we're the late game powerhouse, so we're gonna wait for 25 minutes, wait for everybody to get a few items through. For Niflheim Wargs, is this a composition? One that can kind of get themselves through this early style of game that Hex Mambo may or may not have drafted for themselves. And is this a composition that can work well late game into what Hex Mambo specifically? We look over what Johnny can do on this Kali, the Sun Wukong as well, kind of being that backline nuisance. Is this a composition the Wargs have drafted to be able to deal with what Hex Mambo has? They definitely can get active early. Late game does get a bit scary though. I would say that the Baba matchup in particular, Johnny is going to have a field day. If you blink near her, what what is her defense? If you ult, she just uses her ult to, to say, hey, you're not knocking me back and I'm going to shred through you in the house. If you go into blast off, I just stunned you out of your dash and now you can't get away. So Hawk's going to have to play so safe in the mid lane, right? You have to be, make sure that anytime Johnny's nearby, when he has itemization to shred through you, that you're playing completely safe, far back, peel, very important here for the wargs. I would argue that you might need just constant support from the Aphrodite just to make sure that your Baba stays alive. But in that case, yeah, they, their early pressure is decent enough that they can try and stop what Hex Mamba wants to do. But if you think about it, their gameplay style has always been, let's just get to late game, right? Let's get Johnny online. Let's yep. get our carries online. So they're playing right into their hand. Niflheim Wargs might want to get active maybe a little bit earlier in this game to try and find some success. Otherwise, Hex Mambo, they get to late game. This feels like a devastatingly scary team. And if we're looking at the history between these two teams, Charlie, kind of their matchups throughout the regular season phase for them, Hex Mambo is able to get a 2-0 over the Niflheim Wargs. This is all the way back in late April. They were able to find a win there. So Niflheim Wargs want to get some revenge on Hex Mambo and see if they can do it in one of the more important settings here, being able to find a win against Hex Mambo here and now to keep themselves on the winner's bracket, guarantee that spot against an SPL team to fight up in the next half of the bracket. Could be a big moment for both these teams. They're 4-0 going into the set, but one of them's got to take a loss here. Who's it going to be in game number one? Will it be the Wargs? Will it be the Mambo? Let's jump right into the casters. The two EU powerhouses this weekend. We've already, we, we've seen on Twitter, they're calling EU dominant. NA is going to get sent home. They're all down on the loser's bracket. And it's been these two teams that have been sending those teams down to that loser's bracket. And one of them has to start losing here. Best of three, Niflheim Wargs, Hex Mambo. It is, a, it is a big set. They're guaranteed to, to go up against an SPL team. Whoever wins this set, the other one's going to be sent down to that loser's bracket, have to fight back towards it. 
And I think the poll says a lot. 75% almost are favoring Johnny, and I, I can't blame him. Back on this collie, it, it is, you know, one of his signature picks. He goes back to it. I love that you say 75% favor Johnny. Yeah. It's not Hex Mambo. <laughs> it's Johnny on the collie, and that completely flips the vote. And you know what? You you, you very well could be right. I'd love to see a world where, where Johnny's forced onto something like, I don't know, what, what's a lackluster jungle pick? Right. Achilles. Right. Mine was a little bit more charged, I think, <laughs> think right? So? Think yeah, because so? there's an Achilles on the other side. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the vote might sway there. Uh, I, I'm interested in this matchup, to be sure. I, I, I think the Death does a great job highlighting just how powerful this Hex Mambo composition is going to become once they're allowed to group up as five, start playing around objectives, start leveraging Johnny on this Kali. The Niflheim Wars, on the other hand, it's not as if they've got a poor late game. They, they certainly haven't. Gunther is going to scale very well uh, with a couple of items. Once Prophetic Cloak is done, it, it feels like Gunther is just going to be unkillable. Uh, link him up with Preds, and he's legitimately... Unkillable. Uh, we know that Aphrodite, even in spite of a few nerfs, still does give just enough protection share, has just enough utility. It's just going to be incredibly annoying to deal with. Wow. The major contention point has to be Rapio on the Achilles. Rapio, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. I've had personal experience playing against him for a good long time. Davey, are you good? Oh, my. The shell gets popped. I don't think he would have been Is he good. good. Oh, no, he's, good. he's good. Oh, he's good. He's good. He's got the heal coming through. As well, and I, I think I think you might be right to focus over towards this duel lane because this Aphrodite is something that uh, has had a lot of contention as to whether or not is it is really a top pick, and that was that was for the whole first half of the season. Now all of a sudden, 10.6. We haven't seen it by these SCT, SCC teams at all, and now Brad's on you know perhaps the most important match so far for the the Mamba this weekend. For the Wargs, rather, this weekend. Both of them. Both of them. Yeah, he, he, he pulls out the Aphrodite first game. Yeah, I, I am a prolific, loud Aphrodite hater. I did. I could not have guessed. Yeah, I, I'm a massive, massive detractor from Aphrodite and all of her accomplishments. I'm preying on her downfall. Uh, it just feels like this god is struggles in the laning phase, as example here. Preds now on the retreat should be able to work his way back and towards that tower. Great positioning by Davey to block a few of those critical auto attacks from Spudio. Her laning phase is very weak, at least for the first four or so levels. You get a few more points into Lovebirds, and then you've got the sustain to match up and the ability to clear out those waves. But levels one through three to four look like this. You're going to be stuck in your tower for the most part. You've got single target CC, and you might not even have access to it all the time if the link gets broken. Your, your back off isn't there either. And even to leverage back off on wave, you have to put yourself in danger. So Aphrodite very much so does struggle at this portion of the game. But I will say, Aphrodite, maybe more so than any other god in Smite, is good at winning harder. Mm -hmm. If you're already winning, Aphrodite simplifies it. You can link up to your win condition, whoever's ahead, make them even more difficult to kill, make them even more likely to find kills as they don't have to use their own beads, Aragus. You've got one built into your kit. And she also helps you out on chase, gives you over additional damage, protections, a slow, a heal. Very good at keeping someone who is ahead already there. Aphrodite is not the reason you pull ahead, though. Yeah, and I think that's what wargs want to do with this composition, as we see a couple of buff invades come through across the map, will be secured on the duo side. But on the other side, Johnny and Rapio trade blue buff steals. But Johnny may have bit off more than he can chew, does get the jump off over the wall, and will just be the ultimate burned from Gunter there, so no other boo buff invades. But, I mean, that that seems like exactly what the wargs want to do, right? They want to get off to this early game start. They don't want to let Johnny get into that late game Kali phase. And this Achilles jungle, something that's going to get, you know, maybe a little bit tankier as the game goes on, that may be the way to do it, but that's if the action doesn't start in the duel lane. The third time, I think, Preds or Davia has been posted out or poked out and forced under this Tier 1 tower. This jungle pick, though, this Achilles, I think, has the potential to, to drive a lot of what Wargs want to do. Yeah, the Achilles is certainly capable of securing kills. The Execute going to find value into a few of these targets. Kha'Zix, in particular, I think very susceptible to the Achilles ultimate, that fatal strike. If you can isolate the Terra or even figure out which direction she's going with the dash, and that's easy to do. It's wherever her third ability is. She's dashing directly towards that. You could stun that out, chase down, and the burst healing from Kha'Zix, you know, it's not exactly the most difficult to see coming, not the, exactly the most difficult to play around either. So I expect Rapio to make some rotations over towards that dual lane sooner rather than later. Otherwise, 
You don't exactly have great kill potential into Julio because he's Sun Wukong, and nobody does. Nobody's killing Sun Wukong, not consistently and not without at least a bit of user error on that Sun Wukong's part, at least in the laning phase. Come late game, there's a little bit more entropy, you know, there's a little bit more nuance to that conversation, but in laning phase itself, Sun Wukong uh, in the conversation for safest laners. It was Sun Wukong and Jormungandr sure. for a very long time. And even Merlin, to a certain extent, is very much so capable of just hanging out in arcane stance, walking up to the wave, throwing out his persistent damage on field, backing up, and just rinse repeat, very similar to a, a Kakulkin in execution. Uh, and so, if you are completely reliant on Rapio to be the, the crux of your early game, you gotta find opportunities, and I think those really only do reside in the duo. Well, he's trying to find one in the soul lane. Julio already has that Somersault Cloud online, but they've rotated the support over as well, and they're going to look at this blue buff. Johnny tried to secure it and will do so successfully, and that's exactly what you're looking for at Hex Mamba. They're there on time for the buff invade. They get it. They don't want the fight. They just back away. They're looking to farm up. Yeah, just play it safe, slow down that early game, but when opportunities arise, Hex Mambo, will be privy to take them. Kha'Zix already leveraging his. An invade on the purple buff on the opposite side. No support here. You know, you, you attempt the blue buff on right. No way to defend on left. Davy was already forced back to base. And so, an easy steal for Hex Mambo, who for now uh, have already done better than I think they would have expected. And nursing a slight lead, paltry lead at around 500 some odd gold, but still significant considering there hasn't been any action on map. Neutral farm has been split for the most part evenly just is that that invade and the more efficient gold split from Hex Mambo. Keep your eyes on Kha'Zix. You'll start to see the the level disparity start to develop in favor of the dual lane of Hex Mambo because of these hyper-aggressive rotations from Preds. But I, I think Preds is correct in that it was the right call that you want to get aggressive right now. You want to play around Rapio. You want to catch Hex Mambo in the jungle. It just doesn't always pan out. Even if the idea is right, you got to get a little bit lucky sometimes. Yet again, another rotation towards this left-hand side. Rapio and Preds on to Kha'Zix to start this one off, but will be able to hold on to the dash here and stun Rapio out. So, unfortunately for them, no gank opportunities on this left-hand side. But this may be the start of, you know, Rapio coming over here towards the left side. But talk to me about, I'm really interested in this Sun Wukong because we have not seen this all weekend. We, we've seen these classical tanky soul laners, the Tyr, the King Arthur, come out and have a lot of success to Guan Yu as well. And Julio going into a more damage soul laner and starting out with damage as well, going into that soul leader early on, has no defense yet. Yeah, not a whole lot of defense, but I call soul leader the, the off tank item. You could still be tanky at least in laning phase just through sustain, right? Jinku Bang has so much damage on Wave. You're going to heal off of all six minions now that you've got ability lifesteal thanks to Soul Eater. So you, you make up for lack of defense in just, okay, you've, you've sunk your entire kid into me. I Master's Willed and Jinku Bang the Wave. I'm back to full HP. Uh, worst case scenario, I had a bird out or maybe I go into the Somersault Cloud. So as far as the laning phase is concerned, Sun Wukong might have an advantage at this point just because you can poke out and the damage he does to Kana will stick, whereas Kana, any damage he does to Julio, won't necessarily stick to him. Otherwise, Sun Wukong is very good in the late game team fight at chasing down immobile targets. Sun Wukong is very good at jumping onto mages or getting onto hunters and just disrupting their flow. The knockup from 72 transformations is perhaps one of the most slept on abilities in the game. We, Everybody talks about Tiger Stance. It's a great stun, it's massive damage, it's good burst, but Find a knockup on both backliners, and all of a sudden, Hex Mambo are just going to start tearing through the team fight. It, it facilitates Johnny. It makes sure that the other frontliners of Hex Mambo aren't taking consistent damage. And because it keeps you mobile, it makes it very difficult to actually turn onto Julio. Whereas Tiger Stance, okay, I hit their mage. I'm stuck here. Oh, God. I'm going to go up into the Somersault Cloud. You don't really need to worry about that when you're in that Ox Stance. Right. Rapio has been linked to Preds, I think, since literally six minutes into the game. They fi he finally just backed, so they, they had to break the link. But I think he, he may have realized on that last attempted solo rotation that this is not going to be the lane that he gets to play through. Like, he, he has to come over to the dual lane, come over to that left side. Sure enough, they do get a small invade off. They take away the green buff. But I think, unsurprisingly, we, we get two EU SCC teams who have played each other and are now on the verge of making it into our larger bracket with those SPL teams. Things slow down. Nobody wants to be the first one to step up and make a mistake. It might have been Preds here to lose the ultimate. 
in exchange for a couple of abilities just stepping through the jungle right there. But, I mean, you know, who who makes the first move here? Are both teams happy to farm? I would think the wargs want to get something going here around the mid game. Yeah, I mean, it would be the wargs that, that need to get active a little bit sooner just by nature of Hex Mamba having such a strong scaling composition. But it's not for lack of trying that we haven't seen action. We've seen Rapio make three attempted ganks in the soul lane, two in the duo lane. It, I, I think the issue now for the wargs is realizing, oh, how, how do we lock someone down? How do we actually stick to our targets? We don't have standard CC from our support. There is no CC out of mid. It's got to be Rapio with a blink stun to start your fight. And hopefully Rapio is connected to the Aphrodite so he could survive afterward. That is going to be... A, a continued effort for the Niflheim Wargs. That's not something that's going to change in the 5-on-5. Five five. It's not going to change around objectives. The only thing I could see forcing a fight consistently here for the Niflheim Wargs is if they jump onto something. If it's a Gold Fury, if it's the Control Point, the Pyromancer, force Hex Mambo to walk into you. Because every fight we've seen nearly start so far has been Hex Mambo finding someone isolated and they jump on him, like what happened to Preds earlier. Right. Or it's three members of the Niflheim Wargs walking to Mambo, and Mambo just stays just outside of their, their realm of influence, just outside uh, of the area that the Niflheim Wargs could actually deal sizable damage. There's been a whole lot of kiting. Uh, anytime they get close, it's like two poles of a magnet just pushing away from each other. And, and Hex Mambo legitimately is just right to play that style. With this type of composition, with the pacing of the game so far, Hex Mambo is winning solidly. 11 minutes in, 500 gold separating them, that's nothing. Uh, a ward, maybe a, a second tier of one of these relics, nothing. But the scaling that's starting to stack up is very strong. Johnny, Ken size already finished up. We've seen from him in third slot, it's generally that Hasten Katana. And then all of a sudden, now the Kali is a threat on map. Hawk starting to get some of his proc items. We're, we're looking at things like maybe Spear of the Magus or a Soul Reaver, things along those lines. Once that's there, then Hawk's going to be an issue. Whereas the Niflheim Wargs, they're already playing at, at very strong power spikes. Final Amplifier for Rapio finished up. Gunter finishes his Divine Ruin. They would love to fight. It's whether or not they can find an opportunity to force that fight. Well, they might have one in just a couple of seconds here. Getting to that 12-minute mark, the Stygian Beacon will spawn up soon. Going to grant you a little bit of more damage onto the structures, onto that Titan, a little bit of extra movement speed as well. But... Some poking in the dual lane means the supports will at least be late to this one. It'll be Rapio and Gunter that have the pressure on this point just to start things off. But Johnny hesitating on whether or not he wants to step in, and he may get flanked. Davy and Preds both rotating over to this one. Davy rolling in as well. Aggressive wants to start this one, and Kha'Zix with a triple stun. And the soul laners come over as well. Early fight brings all five members in, and the destruction is there just to get Johnny out safely and will navigate him towards that red buff. Rapio now in on to Spudio will force him towards the green buff, but it's consistent positioning here for the works. They force the Mambo back, and they are looking to secure this beacon. Yeah, maybe the Beacon or a TKO on the three members could net you a bit more. Beacon has been forgotten about by both teams, neither side looking to control the point or perhaps maybe already captured. I think Excuse they did me, get yeah, it. just in the background. That said, could have maybe been an opportunity to leverage that healing from Preds, move in towards that Gold Fury instead. A reset to neutral. The Niflheim Wargs happy in forcing Hex Mambo back, happy in their ability to take that control point for themselves. And even then. I think within the realm of acceptable losses for Hex Mambo. In, in year 10, gold leads are, are much harder to come by than they once were, maybe in season 9, season 8, where two, 3,000 gold, you're already starting to hit that alarm bell. Nowadays, it feels like a gold lead is not solidified until it's around that four to 5,000 mark. And even then, with the comeback mechanics that are in play, nerfed here in 10-6, of course, but still certainly there, one more kill for Hex Mambo closes up the majority of that lead. A first blood would completely turn this back into a neutral state or potentially could put the Niflheim Wargs into an advantageous position. But as it stands, and I think you kind of hearken to this at the beginning of the game when you say 75% of the vote for Johnny, Johnny's got a level lead. He's on Kali. He's doing just fine. And if that's the case, when Johnny's doing okay, I got to think the rest of the team's happy with it, right? That's your late game win condition. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I'm too worried if Johnny has a level lead on the other side. That's exactly what you're looking for. You're feeling okay if you're Hex Mambo. And on the other side, I'm not sure Rappi is feeling too bad, right? This Achilles is, is definitely looking to look do something different, especially as we scale into the late game. It's not this hard carry 
And in fact, talk to me about this build. We just saw Achilles in the soul lane in, in the last the last game, and he did also pick up this vital amplifier, but just a little bit of offense early and then maybe going into a more tanky build after the fact. Yeah, it could be that he's got Bruiser on the mind. Pyromancer burned down to about 30% HP, but it's the fight they're after. Yeah, Pyromancer low, and the wargs will secure it. Hex Mambo hesitant to step up and fully engage, just once again playing on the outskirts of this one as Davey gets poked down and Preds may be caught in a little bit of a rough spot as well. Meanwhile, the soul laner is just trading poke out on the right-hand side. Looks like they'll walk away with a free objective. Yeah, all the while, Spudio able to knock down the tier one on left. So a nearly even trade with the Pyromancer. Can't fully evaluate the value of that neutral objective until the Runic Bomb is channeled. Runic Bomb currently in the pocket of Preds. We'll be keeping our eyes on that. But to get back into the build around Rapio, Vital Amplifier just makes sense to me. You're going to proc that heal regardless. The second ability giving over uh, ability healing to both your first and third abilities means it's always going to be there. Oh my goodness, Kana being taken out lower than I expected, but on the other side, Whoa. these execute targets are dangerous. Rapio is dealing significantly more damage than it looked like they were ready for. Didn't even get a chance to target the executes and will at least rotate over and be able to walk away with the blue buff just making space on the right side. Yeah, good rotation from Rapio, but that is, again, one of the reasons Julio has gone towards the Sun Wukong. That Execute just never had an opportunity. The second he's put in a threshold, jumps up into the Somersault Cloud. Johnny clearly able to make the decision of, all right, well, if he's in the Somersault Cloud, we're not fighting anymore. We've lost too many resources too quickly. Channels his ability or his path out, I should say. Just walks himself out there. Doesn't even need to use the Destruction. Nearly does fall down to the Blue Stone, but fortunately for him, Blue Stone not upgraded just yet. He's a Johnny to be just fine. And so Hex Mambo. Maintain the status quo, which has always been their MO in this match. We'll hit an inflection point shortly. I'd say within the next three to four minutes, where it's going to feel like a, a switch has been flipped. And Hex Mambo is going to be much more willing to take these engagements. Could be around that next Gold Fury. Could be around the Fire Giant. But the rhetoric that I always push around these distinctly European-paced games is that if the first fight happens at the 20-minute mark, the first fight has much more value than any other battle would have. It, you die at... Five minutes in for first blood, it, it doesn't matter nearly as much. You die now, and you're dead for 40 seconds. Could be Fire Giant, and it could just be the game. Could be the Gold Fury here. That gets picked up by the Wargs, and they're on already down to half HP. Kha'Zix and Spudio in range, and Hawk looking to get here as well. But the Soul Laner is here, and Kana is forced Spudio out, and the Gold Fury will get taken down before Mambo get a chance to react. The Niflheim Wargs on the board first with objectives. 1,500 gold, still not too concerned just yet. I need to see that first team fight. See how well the Niflheim Wargs start to scale up now that Hex Mambo has been given an opportunity to finish up some of their itemization. Speaking of, we can check back in. It's Divine Ruin for Hawk in third slot, finished up down the Restored Artifact Tree, likely going to be a Rata Tahuti. Hasten Katana finished for Johnny as well, so he'll have a decent time sticking to that back line. And one of the double-edged swords of this tanky jungle style is that Kin size is going to get additional value if you start stacking up some of that HP. So Johnny and Spudio are going to have a decent time dealing with Rapio a little bit later on. But the dive potential of the Niflheim Wargs, nothing to be scoffed at. It's essentially a four-man front line if you want to include Gunter in that conversation, and I think you should yeah. with Home Sweet Home and how that operates. And so the discussion now becomes for Hex Mambo once they do decide to take that fight is, can you keep Hawk safe? Can you keep Hawk out of range of all this damage? You've got Decent counter engage. Terra always phenomenal in situations like that, but otherwise, the hard CC of Julio, great on knockup, great on aggression, maybe hard to do to peel. Sitching Beacon once again, and Kha'Zix is the engage target off the bat, has to run away, and now it's Johnny who's in on the back line with Julio and forced into the barrage. It's Davey, but the shell and the ultimate comes through, almost saves the life, but Julio grabs the first blood for the Mambo and forces the works back under the Tier 1 tower. They've taken positioning, and it looks like they'll take the beacon. I can't believe Johnny gets away with that. Getting into the back line as Kali, difficult with ultimate. 
has ultimate, doesn't even need to use it, and the fight continues. A TP in from Kana. On his back, and Spudio Aegis gets forced. He doesn't have the ultimate anymore, but he doesn't need it. I'll get the dash out, and this beacon once again flips the other way, but Kha'Zix and Spudio still have the health to contest, and nobody will stay from the works. It's once again the Hex Mambo, who have remained here on the positioning. Looks like they will grab the beacon and grab the first blood. So, a small win for Hex Mambo and a good look at how the team fight could be in the coming moments. Johnny uh, just giving way too much value on, on this Kali in that back line. Felt like the Niflheim Wargs saw him, said, well, he still has destruction and we can't do anything about it. He's just going to channel death immunity. Let's look elsewhere. Okay, but Johnny's going to hit you and keep ultimate then. Someone's got to force that resource. Someone needs to make Johnny think, uh, like consider whether or not it's a good idea to actually be diving. And if he's not taking any damage, it's always a good idea. Pyromancer pulled, dropped low and confirmed by the Niflheim Wargs. Little fight back there by Hex Mambo. We're starting to get concerned now. There's two Runic Bombs in pocket for the Wargs. That means opportunity to either push in towards the Tier 1 mid tower, which would be another POI that could control Hex Mambo's positioning on map. Or it just could be that the Wargs realize that Hex Mambo have still been playing largely hesitant in the 5-on-5 five -five engagement. Could be they could walk in towards that Fire Giant, use that 2,000 true damage to weigh the coin toss in their favor. But I'm starting to get a little bit concerned. The damage is stacking up. Johnny hitting some more significant power spikes. Odysseus bow, charge bow, excuse me. It's only a tier two in pocket. And you've already got the Sunder upgraded from Kha'Zix, a secondary Sunder for Julio. So whoever Johnny sticks to won't have any defense to play with. And it's a heavy frontline emphasis from the Niflheim Wargs and their composition. These next couple five on fives will be very telling. The support builds are, are interesting as well. I mean, you, you mentioned the upgraded Sunder and Ankh on the other side as well, right? As soon as Terra pops that ultimate, pops that Earth and Fury, you're going to have a little bit more damage, a little bit more fight back into these team fights, it feels like. But some positioning around the left side of the map, and no surprise there, the Oni Fury is going to be spawning the second time around here. 21 minutes. Still only one kill. I, I think you, you may have characterized it best when it is a, a typical EU pace, perhaps. These more EU paced games. But it's all about when somebody gets caught out and Johnny, trying to avoid being that person, will be able to jump back in. But they've got the soul laners rotated over towards this side of the map. The Oni Fury here. Potential for a big fight. Doug, go ahead. Help me out here. I'm looking at Preds' build. Which one of the Relic Daggers is that? That's a new glyph here in 10.6. The Bewitched Dagger. Okay, so this is essentially just the Witch Blade on top of a standard Relic Dagger. I think a smart decision to go ahead and deal with some of the attack speed on the side of Mambo. Kana, no hesitation, burns the beads on a Spudio, but it's Julio in the back line, and the Execute is off the mark, and that makes room for Johnny to get in on his own. He finds the engage and forces the other soul laner out as well, but the ultimates have been burned, and the Oni Fury still picked up by the Wargs. Hesitation on the second half of this engagement, though, and Johnny is still behind. Critical positioning here, and the the ultimate, the safety tools have been used, but the peel comes out, Preds with a huge stun, but Rapio dove too far and gets caught out by Spuddy Okana is trapped as well as Johnny finds the ADC, a two for one thus far, make it three. If they finish off Kana, it'll be a double kill for Spudio and Hex Mambo once again find themselves winning a fight. Look, I know it's not Johnny doing the damage, I know it's not that, but I, I have to talk about his positioning that team fight because we saw it. The Niflheim Wargs on their siege forward, Rapio leading the charge, and then there was just a distinct moment, one second, where the Niflheim Wargs look behind them and say, oh no, jo Johnny's behind us, and it completely crushed every bit of momentum that they had. They mm -hmm. stop in their tracks and say, well, we can't keep moving forward. Rapio says, oh, I'm stuck up here, loses his life, and now you're caught in this weird middle ground of, it's a good fight, but if we keep going, Johnny's going to get in behind us. Some people fizzle the engagement, others continue. And when you can't get on the same page, when the wargs are split in their decision making, Hex Mambo, tear him apart. Spudio sinks in every single one of his shots, every auto finding their way home. Hawk able to peel out for his ADC buddy with that arcane stance pull in. And Johnny says, okay, well, they're all staring at me. I'll go join you guys in my own back line. Deal with those frontliners. Clean and simple by Hex Mambo, just keeping the Niflheim Wargs guessing and whether or not they're allowed to get active. And that's not even going to the fact that it's another team fight where Johnny is in the enemy back line and doesn't have to channel destruction. This Kali has not been checked just yet. Relics as they stand, though, 
should favor the Niflheim Wargs if they're able to get into another team fight. Whether or not you actually want to leverage that right now, considering Hex Mabo for the first time this game starting to solidify uh, still a paltry lead, but a lead nonetheless, might keep you guessing on whether or not this is a good engagement. Niflheim Wargs, though, like their odds. No beads or Aegis in either of the carries for Mambo. They grouped around the Pyromancer and it will get channeled here, potentially looking for a coin flip. And the damage getting put out from Hex Mambo makes them hesitate for an extra second. Oof. And naturally, that's when it gets stolen away. I think that was the Heavenly Banner that came down. Spudio takes it away. Thank goodness they don't have a third Runic Bomb to rely on. But now, look at that. I mean, that's 3,000 true damage that's sitting in the pockets of various players here on the map. And we still have not gotten to look at the Fire Giant. And with how the pacing of this game has gone, I wouldn't be surprised if we get to the EFG point and we're trying to do a coin flip there. We're almost at this third Stygian Beacon and, and, and the Titans pushing. This is going to get to a Siege territory. Could be Julio. In some trouble here. Instant channel, the Somersault Cloud. Doesn't want to leave it up to risk. Will lose out on his own safety, but at the end of the day, Sun Wukong's got plenty inherently in the base kit outside of the ultimate. Niflheim Wargs starting to feel the pressure. Whoa. Step forward, blink from Kana. Stun off the mark. It's Kha'Zix in the back. He's in the back, and he channels ultimate onto five, but he dashes in. And who is it but Johnny in the back line, channeling destruction and chasing after Gunter, but he has to jump out. He cannot find the pick he needed. And it's Kha'Zix and Julio pushing forward onto the rest of the wargs. Nobody falls. Everybody's able to heal up. Johnny finally finds his way into the back line and channels the ultimate at least. No kills found. So the Niflheim Wargs realize, looking at Johnny, maybe a good idea in the next couple of fights. And oh my. Hex Mamba, I don't think they're aware of this. Fire Giant pulled by the Warg. Sure, you got the beacon, but can you get there in time? Julio turns the corner. That should be it. They know that it's coming, and they do have the Runic Bombs in the pocket. They might look for the weighted coin flip. Julio's in the field. It's getting low, and the Wargs secure the Fire Giants and are now on their way out. Kano will fall in return. Yikes. They'll hope to keep as many alive as possible. The support falls as well. A two for zero Johnny. for the unenhanced Fire Giant. But Johnny, looking to make it more, will not dive past that Tier 2 tower. Two tanks fall they get the fire giant is it worth it oh man you've got fire giant on your adc but 30 seconds eaten up just by respawns if the divine wargs don't lose a phoenix here we'll have the potential to leverage that fire giant siege soon that's in 10 six you get an extra minute to play with so if this were 10 five we're talking about how hex mambo have absolutely decimated this fire giant siege and there's no opportunities here in 10 six Maybe a little bit more leeway for the Niflheim Wargs. A tier one taken in trade. Titans have spawned. It's the Wargs there first. If the Wargs could knock down Hex Mambo's Titan before they clash, before their own Titan takes too much damage, I think still a massive win for the Order side. It seems to be the case. Take a peek at positioning on map as well. Everybody starting to move towards the center. Seems to me that the Warg's confident now in their ability to siege. They've got the Fire Giant around three, and they've taken down the pushing Chaos Titan, and they've got this tier one tower in their sights. A little bit hesitant, though, to push under this tower. They've got the Titan under helping them out, but the tower is only falling as fast as they can hit it, and everybody has stepped back. They will grab the tier one, but they will let their Titan fall to Hex Mambo as they make their way over towards the Gold Fury side. It's a five-man stack from Niflheim Wargs, nearly able to spring a trap on a Kha'Zix on rotation in. Are Hex Mambo willing to fight into a triple fire giant team for a primal fury? Gold lead's so massive for Mambo that even if they lost this, wouldn't be a massive swing for the Wargs. But I suppose if the gold lead's massive, there's no reason to give it up either. Primal Fury reset just by Hex Mambo showing face. Keep your eyes on Rapio, though. He's gone around the edge of the team fight. Both of these junglers have the critical positioning. Johnny in mid lane as well. Will surely be looking for a flank Hawk's here. But then he walks over Ward and they find the engage. Hawk the execute is timed perfectly. And the mid laner's taken out first in this fight. But look at Johnny. He is behind the entire enemy team. And Rapio has found a double execute on to the members of Hex Mambo. While Johnny picks up the ADC and is looking for more. A triple for Rapio. And Julio has to clean it up with a double kill of his own. And all of a sudden, a three for three leaves Spudio and 
and Julio fighting wow. for their lives. Just barely enough damage, and Spudio grabs a double of his own. A deicide for Hex Mambo. They'll push down right lane. Beautiful team fight for Rafio. Got to get that out of the way immediately. The Achilles doing much more in the late game than I think anybody had expectation of him, especially considering this eclectic build. But. It's the blink from Julio at the very tail end that completely seals the team fight for Hex Mambo. Blinks in front of the kiss that was aimed at Spudio would have prevented the chase down potential. Maybe one or two members of the Wargs walk out alive afterward. Julio blinks right in front of it and keeps the fight rolling, turning it into a clean deicide for Hex Mambo. Johnny, of course, does immense damage in the back line, nearly able to match output with Rapio. But at the end of the day, it's Hex Mambo and their self-sufficient backline, the immense damage they were to return to the front line of the wargs that swings things around. A fight that begins at the Primal Fury, ends there. But it's Hex Mambo into the face of three fire giant members of the Niflheim wargs that come out massively ahead. Wow. It was 4,000, maybe 5,000 gold separating these two teams, but a big team fight swings further in favor of the late game slanted squadron. Hex Mambo on the upswing. Looking fantastic in these last couple of fights. And, and, and I think, you know, Johnny, as much as we can speak to him and the damage that he's doing, he's almost been more of a facilitator this game. He's not getting the double or the triple kills in these fights. He is outputting the damage he needs to be, surely. But he, he makes his space known in the back line, and the wargs have to dump everything into him. He is just a nuisance, and that gives Johnny, the chance to, to, to make the space. Julio gets to do the damage. Spudio gets to do the damage. And, and and look at this build that's coming through. He's got a Brawler's Beat Stick as well on the Sun Wukong just to deal damage. Grabs the double kill 4 0 and 5 and 5 0 and 4 for those two damage dealers. Maybe if you're the Wargs, with how these fights have going, with how that fight goes specifically, maybe you have to change your target focus here. You do, but it's, again, that, that composition issue for the Niflheim Wargs of how do we stick to the carries? How do we get in there and stick to them? You don't have the initiation consistently. Kata, oh Sunder connects. He's just dead. Easy pickup for Spudio. Kata, what are you doing so far up, bud? That early in the game, and then Johnny makes it happen here? Destruction channel. He'll get out with a pick. And out of nowhere, it is a two for zero in favor of the Mambo. And that's going to make room for them around this enhanced Fire Giant. They may not even be done yet. It will be a back for Johnny as he is now on his way back towards this enhanced Fire Giant. But with three members still on the map, I would be remiss if, if Niflheim Works didn't at least try to contest this objective. Still holding on to that runic bomb in their pockets and Gunter and Preds linked up here as Julio is on zone duty. This is falling slow though. It's only Cudio and Kha'Zix on the fight, but Rapio gets caught as well. It is three picks in a row. And with that, the rest of the words have to back off. Hex Mambo, clean. This pick-based late game composition paying for itself in dividends here. The Niflheim Wargs struggling to find footing on the map. The only way I can see them finding that footing is grouping up his five, and they miss that first critical hurdle. And instead, it's Hex Mambo, who cleanly sweep the map, take Fire Giant for all five, enhanced, by the way, and start to knock on the door of the Titan. 30 seconds, the Wargs have to play without their jungler. 5v4 here, and they do have a minion wave a couple seconds behind them as they push under this middle Phoenix. A triple stun there for the support, and that enables Johnny. He's in on the mid laner. Can't and do nobody that. Nobody can help Gunter. It's just the Aegis, but Johnny will find the pick, and he's still alive in the back line. That makes room for Hawk. He grabs Preds, and they grab the middle Phoenix as well. It's just the two members remaining, and they do not have enough to stop it the push down hex mambo take game one hex mambo they wrote up this script 33 minutes ago hang on tight just wait it out get to the late game and we win every single time i mean you can see the confidence of the booth throwing up a thumbs up to the other side you played in my hand perfectly say hex mambo if the wargs want to win they're gonna have to throw them off tilt there's got to be something you can do getting johnny off a of Kali, that's step one surely sure. get rid of that Otherwise, I mean, even just looking at the damage output, it wasn't entirely Johnny. Johnny, of course, facilitating a lot of those team fights by positioning, but you got to give credit to Spudio, the damage output that he has, the Merlin as well, absolutely amazing. The Wargs needed to find a little bit more in that early game, 
but just couldn't quite make their damage stick. I think for as much as Julio did on the Sun Wukong, I'm surprised we haven't seen it at all this weekend. It's, it's may, maybe a little bit of a sleeper pick, maybe a Hex Mambo specific pick right there. I mean, how do you, you talk so many times about the, the weaknesses maybe of the Wargs draft, that they just don't draft around a CC heavy support. They go into something a little bit unique to them, a little bit unique to their play style. What, what needs to change there for them to just have a little bit of a better team fight come 33 minutes? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm incredibly biased on this topic. <laughs> I hate Aphrodite. All my homies hate Aphrodite. So maybe get off Aphrodite. But maybe. if you are going to lock in Aphrodite, and if you're going to do it, and I can't stop you, can't stop the SPL teams, how would I stop the SEC boys? Get your CC somewhere else. Get someone that can consistently start your team fight. If it needs to be a Horus out of the soul lane so you have Fracture, fine. If you want to put a Guardian there too, fine. But you need to have someone that can lock down these targets and make sure your damage finds those priority targets. Well, we've heard Mifflin's advice. Niflheim Org's got to go back to the drawing board. We'll see what they come up with right after the break.
You've been wanting to get one of the best ice shakers out on the market or even some of the best drink supplements out there. Make sure you go visit our friends over at Advanced GG by going to advanced.gg and picking up not only the God Slayer bundle, which comes with the God Slayer energy and the ice shakers a combination discounted for you, the fans out there, but you can pick up anything else that Advanced GG has to offer. And if you do so, make sure you use code SMITE to get 10% off of your order for those items out there. Thank you so much to Advanced GG for joining us in Season 10 of the Smite Pro League and in Year 10 of Smite as a whole. Great products that Advanced GG has to offer for all of you out there, so make sure that you go check them out when you get the opportunity to do so. Here in Game Number 1, Hex Mambo and Niflheim Ward go about 20 minutes or so, Charlie, where pretty much nothing happened. I think it's yep. safe to say not a whole lot happened in the in the first 20 minutes of the game. True. But once that first blood comes through, once the ice starts kick off around that second beacon spawn or so, that's when Hex Mambo really started able to come online. A lot of the damage output coming through Spudio, but as mentioned, a lot of great positioning by Julio and Johnny to really get this thing set up. Yeah, it seemed like not only was the backline doing as much damage as possible, I mean, <laughs> Spudio was popping off on the damage charts, as you can imagine. Um, you know, I think that Johnny finally got online on that, that Kali pick that we warned about. That could be a ticking time bomb if they were able to get to, you know, 20 minutes in with only one kill. That sort of thing does not bode well for your late game. Unfortunately here for the wargs, the duo lane got pretty much dealt with. It didn't seem like Davey or Prez were really able to get much done at all. And of course, Gunter, not a great matchup. Johnny was able to just shred through this Baba Yaga pretty consistently late game because there's not much that B Baba brings to the table self peel wise that Kali can't really be dealt with. And you highlighted it as well. Julio on the Su Sun Wukong wasn't doing too much damage, but the survivability and the movement that that pick brings was clearly uh, very annoying to deal with as well. 4-0 and 8 there for that pickup. So not a lot to take away when the matchup goes that late. I would say that early pressure, still something that the Wargs could have done to try and offset the late game comp that the Hex Mamba went for. But as we've learned time and time again, it's not like you can ban out Johnny. He has so many different picks that can play that style of jungle. Yeah, it really feels like the only way to, to quote-unquote ban out Johnny is to spend all three of your first bands on what, Bakasura, Akali, Alquang, and then like pick a Loki for yourself or not ban one of those three and then take the latter of those four for your own side there. So we'll have to see if the Nephon works. Do you decide to put priority towards Johnny? Do you continue trying to ban out the jungler? Maybe... Do you focus else somewhere else? It really did feel like this was a good early composition for the Niflheim Warriors to try and get the ball rolling, but Charlie just felt like they didn't do anything with this early game lead that they could have been afforded to. Could have been. Could have. That's what I'm saying. If you yeah. don't get kills by 19 minutes, one kill, I should say, it's like, you know, maybe you try to force a little bit earlier of a composition. Well, we'll see maybe if the Warriors can get an earlier composition. Will they ban out Johnny? All those questions and more will be answered. Picks and bans. Game number two between Mambo and the Wargs. Hex Mambo now 5-0. To start their weekend, out of time works four and one with their first loss. Now being handed to them by their EU counterparts in the second seed, Hex Mambo. And we'll see the Wargs actually move over to second pick this time through. Be a Yemoja ban by Hex Mambo. Niflheim Wargs stick with the Bakasura ban, trying to put a little bit of focus towards Johnny, while Hex Mambo work on banning out Preds more than anybody else. Seems that a oh. lot of support oriented mindset bans for Mambo and Wargs. It might just be taking the advice of hard you. ban Johnny out here, maybe. As we see two Johnny bands, do we see the Al Kwong or the Loki? This is Coach J Mac at work. Let's see if they take your advice and just focus out all of Johnny's picks. And but again, then, but then they got to pick. Uh, they also have to pick before Johnny too to take his fourth one. I mean, I still think the Hebo is pretty high up on the my list in my mind. I so he had a Hebo. Yeah. So, oh no. Uh, that's what I was saying, Johnny. Oh no, you need more bands. It's real difficult more to picks. try and ban out Johnny. They're attempting to do so. It looks like they are thinking about this last one. Smart, I might add. Do you even want to waste a ban on Johnny or say, hey, let's try and, you know, limit what everyone else was able to do? Because again, Spudio looked fantastic. It wasn't just the Johnny show. And it looks like they will just take away the Discordia, which inherently buffs just about anyone on Mambo who's going to be able to get top damage. The Baba Yaga is still a pick that has been highly contested between both of these teams. But because it was, I mean, largely dealt with in game number the one there from Gunter, Hex Mambo don't, they're not forced to pick it up here in first pick. Yeah, so with the Disco and two jungle bans by the Borgs, Hex Mambo still continue to train his support bans with a Terra in their final ban column. And now Hex Mambo maybe taking a little more time than we would imagine for a first pick here. We've been seeing a lot of Snaplock Baba Yaga if left open to this point, but then that does give over potential of Hachiman to the opposite side here. But Hex Mambo do lock in the mid lane mage. 
give themselves a little bit of that extra burst damage over from the mid lane. The extra bit of tankiness afforded to the, from the Prophetic Cloak as well has been a very versatile god pick for any team that goes through. But instead, the Fon Wargs, they're going to go early, pick up that King Arthur in first slot. Something that Kana has been leaning on quite a bit. I'm not going to say it's just been working fantastically. It's been going from really well to last game didn't have too much to offer, but that may just be because of the slow pace game. Kana still feels that this pick brings a lot to the table. And at the very least, you're going to have a fine time in lane. With that, though, the Hachimana pick, taking that away from Spudio, definitely a good look. I wasn't a big fan of the Rama from Davey. His positioning came into question a bit. Hachiman, very hard to catch him out of position. That mounted archery can get you out of trouble very easily, just so much movement. And uh, that safety could be something the Wargs want to lean on here in game number two. I saw an 86% win rate on the Hachiman so far in the games that he has been played. I believe it's seven games he's had the opportunity to be at least be picked up in only one of those we have seen be a loss so far. So it could be at least a small a small stepping stone now for Nifheim Works to try and find some success in their draft. But King Arthur Hachiman is a top two. Now leaves Hex Mambo with the decision. Do you pick up Johnny's pick Johnny. now? Johnny. I imagine the answer to that has got to be yes because then nope. Nifheim Works could just ban away his other two big picks, but Fear not going to do God. so. Tier and Rom, the pickups for Hex Mambo. Tier, one of those big power picks for Julio in the solo lane. Yep, Tier. Gonna have a good time. Not the greatest matchup in the King Arthur, but there's still moments where you can find success in that lane. Now the stun has been added to Lawbringer. All the spinning that King Arthur can do, and the cripples, of course, you can have some answers for. But more often than not, you're not even picking anymore to counter the enemy solo laner. You're picking to try and find value in force rugs for your team, which Hachiman and Agni are your targets in this regard. So the carry's already locked in here for the wargs. They do have Plenty of range damage between Agni and Hachiman, just being able to sit back at a distance and try and stay away. Unfortunately, Baba Yaga and Rama still do bring a lot of that same range with their ultimates, of course, being able to snipe from across the map and home sweet home, just lobbing those fire attacks from a fair distance as well. Still banning out Johnny, there's the Niflheim Wargs and Al Kwong. I was expecting maybe an immediate snap Loki ban as well, but seems the Wargs are not gonna go with that route just yet. Hex Mambo will continue their support bans, going with Nox, so it's been entirely focused on Preds. We'll see a switch up though, Maui. Now the ban for Nifheim works, something that they've seen at least a little bit of success on themselves, but haven't really seen too much at least from Hex Mambo. I think Kha'Zix did have a couple of games where he was able to pilot that pick, looked really good for him, so maybe a wise ban to take some of that kind of non-committal initiation away from Hex Mambo. But now stray away from the support bans for Mambo. It'll be a Thor ban up against Rapio. No surprise seeing that there. And now Rapio going to go back to a pick that's worked really well for him this weekend, hovering the Kamazots as they pick and likely to lock that one in. And hit, hit or miss this Kamazots pick. It is very safe. It does bring incredible damage, but you miss that second ability, your whole engage can go downhill. So got to make sure you're on point with the, the qualifications on the line here. Hex Mambo going up 1-0. And if Lime Wargs go to the Kamazots, that shows me that Aid Rapio is feeling confident. And why not, right? If you're feeling this good, you might as well give him a pick like that where you got to make sure that all of your abilities are on point. You were talking about how the Loki could be something that just gets snap locked here. But Kamazots, at the very least, has some ways to track Loki in that invis. Just keep his tabs on him. Maybe even pick up an Erendite for his team. Things like that. Just to make sure if that is something that Johnny wanted to go to. They have some answers for it. But I still think there's... You know, Johnny play, has played a lot of picks in his time in the SPL and in the SCC. Doesn't have to go to the Loki if he feels like he wants to get even more early pressure. I still think that things like the Fenrir or even the Hebo have a decent time uh, into what the Wargs have drafted so far. But with that being said, I would like to see a little bit more CC. So far, you got Tier to pull some beads away. Uh, Support-wise, the Nox, the Terra, the Horus, the Yamoja, the Maui, a lot of picks taken away that would be able to benefit from those burnt beads. Something like the Kuzenbo oh, wow. there it is. comes through. This is a pick that was banned away a fair bit towards the beginning of this tournament. Sort of went, I'm not going to say uncontested, but just under the radar for a bit. It's going to be the Loki and the Kuzenbo being locked in. A lot of tick damage on the side of the wargs. Yeah, a lot of small little spurts of damage more than anything. Not a, a whole lot of burst until this Baba Yaga really comes online, until Johnny hits this Loki. And Charlie really feels like this is a, another Hex Mambo style of draft where you wait for 20 minutes to go through, you get Johnny three items online, let this Loki do Loki things, and try and win out through here. 
Nilheim Wargs, one more pick to go for themselves. Need their support. But we've already seen five of those banned away, and then a Kuzumbo picked up something as we talked a little bit about. Saw a lot of priority towards bands yesterday. Haven't seen really much of anything today from the Kuzumbo. So now we're going to see his first pick, and maybe we'll finally get us to see a reason why we're seeing this one. At least band away. Though some buffs did come to Kuzumbo, a little bit more reflect damage on those shell spikes. Yep. I believe a little bit more damage mitigation on the ultimate as well. I can't lie to you, J-Mac. I, I faced a Kuzumbo recently, and he made my life just miserable. Oh You're God. able to build just like full tank, glad shield, maybe even throw in a, a late game Soul Reaver if you're feeling it. Kuzumbo can be given a good position. It all depends on... You know, if you're ahead, if you're behind, you just kind of get blown up before you can make use of those shell spikes. But Agni, uh, Kamazots, both have a lot of tick damage. They can reset the shell spikes, give you a double sumo slam, two nanes. You got to watch both of them. Can be difficult to try and deal with. Nice. Sobek, final pick now for the Niflheim Warg. So a full look at the composition in the draft here. You got some decent, at least initial com initiation here from the Sobek. You walk up, you pluck somebody. Usually you'll either burn beads or throw a target back. Maybe force out some relics afterwards, some quick mobility here for Niflheim Wargs. Have their immediate kind of linear style initiation now for this team. For Hex Mambo, again, really feels like a, a comp that's going to wait a little bit longer. So for the Wargs, considering how, I guess, maybe inactive they were in Game 1, given the composition that they had, is this another composition for the Wargs that could just be fine being inactive and work well towards the late game, or is this one that really needs to get active a little bit sooner? I don't think they need to, but it is a, a composition that probably should have that ability, especially with the Kamazots, I think, level 5. Once you get your Blink online, once you get your ultimate, you have so much safety, you have so much dive, and all of that means that you have the ability to get aggressive early. After watching game number 1, I would say the Wargs probably should be trying to get aggressive early because letting Hex Mambo get to level 20, letting Johnny have freedom on a pick like Kali, or in this case Loki, can be disastrous. So I'm not going to say that they have to, but... Let's be honest, gambling the dice on is Johnny going right. to carry once he gets online doesn't seem like the smartest gamble. Well then for the wargs, you know, wanting to get active early, are there any real good targets maybe for the jungler, for Rapio to try and get active on this Kamazot? Do you full commit dive to trying to take down this Baba before maybe the Prophetic Cloak goes online? Do you try and camp out the ROM? Or where do you kind of go as Rapio and this Wargs team to try and find some of that early pressure? I would imagine side lanes are your best call just because they're a little bit longer. You have a little bit more chase down. It's kind of hard to try and gank a Baba Yaga with a Kamasachi. She has a lot of built-in safety to just you know blast off, use the ultimate. The tick damage is too scary. But... You know, Rama and Kuzumbo are certainly decent targets, especially if you get over there early, you catch them too far up at a shield buff, something like that. And even with tier, even with all the safety that this pick does bring, there's always going to be a way to catch out a solo laner if you catch them lacking too far up in solo lane as well. So if I'm Wargs and Hex Malo, game number one, we went 18 and a half, almost 19 minutes before seeing any first blood action kick off, and then everything exploded from that point through, and it was Hex Mambo coming out on top for game one. Niflheim Wargs have got to find a win in game number two to get that qualification chance for a game number three. But it's all got to start here in game number two. Can they tie up the set or is this going to be another 2-0 sweep for Hex Mambo? Let's jump right in with the casters for game two. Hex Mambo and the Niflheim Wargs trying to push it to three for the Wargs. Hex Mambo trying to clean it up here. It's Frog, it's Miff, it's Doug on the call and uh both teams bring in quite a few differences in the compositions here to the table and i i, I think doug's right to put us on that kuzenbo <laughs> right at the start of things because that is where my eyes immediately went as well into these support matchups the sobek going up against the kuzenbo how does that change this dual lane so Sobek is much more of an initiator style pick. He, he wants to find the pluck, displace somebody, tail whip to keep him there, and then lurking in the waters to keep him there even longer, right? When I think of Kuzumbo operating at the highest level, there are two avenues of play. It's either jump onto enemy mid laner and make him miserable, because if he hits you, he takes more damage than he's doing to you, or it's play in your own back line and, and just make it miserable for the dive of the enemy team. Rapio can blink in, land Vampiric Bats and Screech, and both connects with Hawk, and now he's down to 50%. Oh, whoops, Watery Grave, and I've been knocked up 20 times in a row, and Hawk's already all the way back in base, right? So two distinct styles of play for Kuzumbo, whereas Sobek a little bit more so inclined to just play the I'm going to land my pluck and hope it works out style of play. So there's a reason we haven't seen Sobek a whole lot. I believe it was Iraffer last time he was in studio that had said, Sobek's interesting because I love playing him, but if I land a pluck in the late game, 
and they have beads, I will die every single time, but I'll have known that I burnt the beads, right? And, that, <laughs> and that's about it. So uh, a thin, nice edge that Prez is going to have to be navigating going forward. But I would argue that the Niflheim Wargs have got themselves a, a much stronger composition. Just blanket statement, much better here in Game 2. And, and I would argue that Johnny, even though it is one of his signature picks in the Loki, Loki's probably just straight up worse as well. So we'll see how well he's able to form. Uh, and I know that I'm opening myself up to a lot of criticism anytime I call into question anything Johnny has even considered doing. Absolutely. Um, but, I, I, you know, I, I like that. I, I like conflict and, 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 and spreading hatred and misinformation. Sure. No, I mean, absolutely. I, I feel like that's that's pretty much your style. And I think it's Johnny's style to uh, to carry games. It, yep. it, it kind of feels like. And it, it, it's, it's fascinating because I can't think of one other jungler – one other player, SPL, SCC, anywhere, where I can safely call four picks signature picks, right? Like, I, I can't think of one other player in maybe the history of, of competitive where I would so easily call all the three picks that just got banned out and this fourth Loki that he has gone to. And even then, he could have gone to the Hebo. Like, we talked yesterday, I think, about the difficulties of banning this guy out. And they attempt to do it. They take away three of his priority picks, and still he gets to go back to this Loki and just runs the game a different way. You know, I'm an awful co-caster, so I'm going to go ahead and blow up your spot. And oh, it's Sino. Do. It's Sino. I can name 17 signature picks. Nike, Surter, everything in the Warrior tab. Okay, Naja. Okay, okay, no, 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 no. Playing something for the first time decently and being the only one that does it does not make it a signature pick. What do you mean? He's the only one doing it, though. The only person that plays Nike you So you're saying if, if I went yeah. into the SPL and I played Nike Jungle. I'd be like, wow, he's, he's trying to pull a Sino. And I think therein lies the signature pick. I, I think you're reaching, man. <laughs> I think you're reaching. All right, chat. <laughs> Who's right? Get at him in the comments. Dude, I don't know, man. What I am sure about, though, is that I, I find no problem with calling this Loki a signature pick Agreed. for Chani, right? And I think that it definitely changes up a little bit what he wants to do, right? Sure enough, not going to wait until 33 minutes, I think, to, to find those first couple of fights, and hopefully not until 17 minutes to find the first blood. Definitely has a little bit more early pressure on this pick. Yeah, Loki, very capable uh, of getting involved a little bit earlier on. Doug, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to see the ability priority order for Johnny, because at times he's elected to max out Vanish in first slot. At others, it's been that flurry strike, and it will be the flurry strike this time around. Looking at the composition from the wargs, they haven't got the, the greatest ways to, to cancel it. Of course, it could be the pluck from Preds, or maybe the EI Jutsu from Davey, or the stun from Gunter, but Rapio doesn't have an answer, and... Kana would have to dedicate the ultimate to stop Flurry, and if that's the case, I'd argue Johnny had found his value. Preds barely able to make it out of there. That tail whip well placed. Had Kha'Zix been able to avoid it, shoves him into a wall, Preds likely would have been limping back to base or perhaps in a body bag. So fortunately for him, not the case. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Ventured and still nothing gained there for the Sobek. I think in game number one, maybe, maybe a defining fact of hold that thought, talk under some pressure here in the mid lane, and, and maybe I'll change my point of view over towards these these junglers, right? Because in game number one, we talked about the Kali, the late game, and, and how satisfied both teams felt to just, sheesh, that is, <laughs> that is a rough one to watch. Wow. Uh, not, uh, definitely going to want to shore up those plucks if you're Preds as we go throughout the game. But he was invisible. All right. They are, uh, they are trying to find the pressure regardless. Johnny does have that ultimate, maybe forced to use it to get away, but instead it'll be Kha'Zix using that watery grave just to hold on to the peel, and Johnny is able to hold on to his own assassinate to get out of there. But you already see the pressure Rapio has. He's looked good on this Kamazots throughout the weekend and is already in the enemy jungle. Yeah, Kamazots, really good matchup in a Loki as well. That Screech gives you vision so long as you're able to pick up the, the proc of it. And so should be able to chase out Johnny given the opportunity. Vampiric Bats off the mark, knocked up oh in a tower. Gosh. Rapio still has ultimate. Be forced to use it here, but that is a, 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 as critical a failure on, on, yeah. an, on execution from Rapio as possibly could have been. That is the only world where Bat Out of Hell needs to get channeled. And now, if he locks eyes with Johnny, who still has Assassinate, by the way, might just die here. Fortunately for Rapio, Johnny just uses an entire kit clearing no! out the jungle. And Hawk, off the back of a phenomenal play, loses it all. Oh, no. He gets soloed in the mid lane. I'm going to call it a solo kill, even though most of the damage, I think, was done early there by Rapio. But 
The weird engagement in the middle lane lands us a first kill for both squads, thankfully, before 17 minutes. Johnny on the board for Hex Mambo. Niflheim Wargs get Gunter on the board first. And I think you see it come through. You, you might see it come through in terms of, of, you know, these small level leads, half a level lead here, half a level there. But I, I think you also brought up a good point last game. The kill at 20 minutes is going to mean a lot more than the kill at 5 minutes, and that still holds true for these small trades in the early game. I'm not feeling too bad about that. No, the only thing a, a kill at the 5 minute mark is going to do for Johnny is get Transcendence online a little bit faster, which could feel like a, a game-ending moment uh, if you're me <laughs> and you're a Doomer, right, on the other side. If I'm Rapio, I'm like, oh, God, he's just going to go back to base and start stacking. I, I'm not even close to mine. Dude, but, we haven't won the game yet? Yeah, I mean, God, what, what do we do here? But... Uh, at the end of the day, if it were 20 minutes, that's a gold fury or potentially a fire giant. Right. So the, the faster paced game tends to lead to a little bit more action that might be considered slightly less impactful. But if the lead finds itself to the right targets, could have ripple effects on the rest of the match. And I think anybody would argue Johnny is the right target to find that lead. Pushes that half level to an entire level now. Eight to the seven of Rapio on the other side. Has finished up that transcendence. And then a slight departure in itemization between these two junglers. It's down the Mace Tree for Rapio. Could be a Brawler's Beat Stick, could be a Jotun's. Just depends on how Rapio is feeling day of. Whereas on the other side, Johnny going into this tree, it's just got to be a Hydra's Lament, even further boosting that burst potential that Loki has. Yeah, I mean, and, and definitely bringing him into this early game conversation. Uh, as Kali, you like to get maybe three items on lane, waiting until you have that hasten. But both of these junglers are, are not going to be hesitating to, to getting to getting involved around this 10 to 12 minute mark, which is where we saw the, the hesitating fight start last time around, especially around this Stygian beacon. But Goodness. Davey dashing in will take a little bit of a poke. Looks like he was off the mark with that EI Jutsu. And, I, you know, talking about the sports, we, we mentioned the, the positives and negatives of this Sobek and, and of this Kuzan. Most certainly, I think, more of a positive here. Has to hit it. Will burn the beads. And Spudio will dash away. So... Thankfully, not a boosh beads there. Otherwise, that could have spelled doom uh, for Spudio. But, I, you know, we talk about these supports. Spreads get more of a chance to, to be aggressive, find that CC, not on the Aphrodite. You know, anymore, he kid does have that pluck he can throw out. But what surprised me, and this is a whole thing, throughout the weekend, throughout 10.6, these supports have been so hesitant to rotate out of the dual lane. Yeah, that's something we've seen in, in year 10 in general. It feels like... What was previously in Season 9, a 4-minute rotation, has been pushed back to that 8-9-minute to nine minute mark as Johnny, nice ultimate, connects with Gunter, and that should just be it. It is. Johnny cleans up the kill onto the mid laner, but now Rapio looking to answer back. Needs one more auto and will find Johnny in return. Preds lurking in the waters, find safety under the Tier 1 tower, but Davey and Spudio have both rotated over to this side of the map as well. All it'll do is burn the mounted archery, and it'll once again be a 1-for-1. Goodness, the positioning of Hawk has just been phenomenal so far this set. Even there, home sweet home finds just about as much value as you could hope for. Lands nearly every shot of the fire bolts. Able to avoid that pluck from Preds as well. Just clean stuff from the Baba Yaga, and that's before Prophetic Cloak. So if you're thinking she's slippery now, only becoming more difficult as the game goes on. And I think Johnny's willingness to trade out his life here, uh, a departure from what we had seen in the previous match, very much so active, doesn't really seem to be too concerned with his own KD. We've seen tower dives already, invade attempts as well. Uh, it's probably due to the fact that Johnny doesn't really see himself as the the necessary hyper carry of this late game. Now you can lean back a little bit, say, well, Spudio is going to scale incredibly well in the late game because Rom, you know, or Baba Yaga can do it, so I know Hawk's got me. And, and it's more so Johnny now acting as a facilitator. You can even see it in experience share on map. Johnny has been much more willing to split some of these jungle buffs or even allow Hawk to solo them out. Whereas previously on the Kali, Hawk had to race Johnny to every single camp. Had to race him or he wasn't going to get any of that farm. Right. So the adaptability of Johnny now starting to show itself. And I, I think going to be difficult for the Niflheim Wargs to make that adjustment. Even then, I, I just love the Loki matchup in the Agni late game, even into the... The Hachiman as well. I'm sure one of the safer picks, but his safety doesn't remove him from the play field. So hop on the horse and bleed out on the way out, I think. It's going to be something we see a fair deal. Small fight here in the mid lane. We'll burn a couple of those abilities just to poke down Sheesh. Johnny pretty significantly. Guns are already starting to do that damage. And I was actually going to bring up that point, this departure from, from the norm, or at least from each other 
on these mid lane builds. You've got this double penetration for, for Gunter, trying to be a more aggressive early. And then you've got this Charon Coins, which thanks to the Baba passive, already stacked up, but we won't even get to talk about it. Instead, it's the blue buff invade. Julio and Johnny trying to defend against three of the Niflheim wargs. They'll grab the buff and they will look to get out. Although Kha'Zix may be coming around the back end. They've got to be careful they don't overstay. Just want to come back in, let Kana grab the blue buff. And now it should be the jump, the dash, the movement ability away. They'll get away with one. Yeah, Johnny a little bit too low, I think to stick around in that fight, hovering at around 60% before the engagement had even started in earnest. And with the blue buff successfully defended by Hex Mambo there, not a whole lot of incentive to stick around in the engagement. It's on the Niflheim Wargs to make something happen, and a pluck onto Tyr displaces him, but at the end of the day, it's a Tyr, and he's two items stacked and in the defense stance, so difficult to shut him down as well. Kha'Zix needs to play carefully here. Could have just delivered Preds to his own back line, but unconcerned. Ultimates here channeled from Hawk. I mean, I'm not sure that I necessarily agree with the with the evaluation there that Preds was killable as he was sort of just walking away, had the pluck available. But Johnny being in the area and, and Hex Mambo certainly seem more willing to pull the trigger themselves. Uh, and, you know, that's got a lot to do with their composition. They've got certainly more early game prowess and a lot of their different characters. But, you know, if, if Johnny, similar to last game, maybe looking to be a facilitator, looking to trade one for one over anything else, I, I'm wondering how he's going to fight. But, you know, he this is the early game fight. This is the first fight of the, the game. You want to be here for this capture point. And Hex Mambo, I, I think, surprisingly, are not here at all. It's just going to be the wargs that take that for free. Yeah, it was desynced rotations there from Hex Mambo. Individual members forced back to base one at a time. So good poke out by the Niflheim Wargs. Affords them the opportunity to take the first control point without any bit of fight back. Every single control point certainly valuable as Hawk. Forced to use those beads post-pluck from Preds and sent back to base. I don't know if we've, we've talked about it enough, but even just grabbing one control point is still very valuable. 5% additional structure damage, 1% yeah. global movement speed for every single capture point that you're able to grab. So ideal world, 15% uh, additional structure and 3% global movement speed for your team. Just helps you out on some of those late game sieges, which have been a major talking point here in year 10. A lot of teams struggling to legitimately close out these games, break the base, get through that first Phoenix. The control point helps out a whole lot in situations like that. And the first one going to the Niflheim Wargs means everybody's just a little bit faster. Does a little bit more damage to these towers. Yet again, the wargs on the front foot here around this blue buff, but this time Julio will successfully defend that and maybe try to catch out Kana here. Johnny channeling that flurry strike, but will back off. Nose Gunter is on the way in and getting chunked by that rain fire, having smartly not choosing to engage there onto the soul lane. But it's, it's the Wargs who have a, a small gold lead, right? This is definitely more than we can say for them as they were in, in game number one, despite the fact that it seems like there has almost been less fighting, right? I mean, a lot of the Wargs... I don't know if I can get behind you on that. There's four kills. There's four kills, but almost all of them... I mean, one of them was not even a fight, right? Okay. It was just a trade in mid lane. The other one was perhaps the only fight that we've seen this game. No objectives, only the Stygian Beacon. Nobody showed up to it. Everything else has been a small engagement like that where nobody's been hesitant. Niflheim Works have continued to ask the question, and this time they're 2k gold up for just asking those questions. But Hex Mambo still yet to kind of respond in, in a way where it, it feels like their comp has the ability to respond a little bit better now. Yeah, I agree. It's not as if Hex Mambo are, are looking at a composition like game one where it's get to 30 and just win. Wow. This is why we see these attempts here. Gunter stuck in the tower. Bleed no good. No way! Johnny Ooh. has to go back in, but Hawk in trouble on the other side. In trouble is right. Rapio channels the ultimate, but does not hit the last strike and misses the vampire Yikes. bats as well. Hawk on single digit HP, but he cannot find the trade. It'll be a one for two there. And once again, Hex Mambo respond, but they're on top. Yeah, Hex Mambo clearly reactive in their decision making, but reacting properly for the most part. Love that, uh, that play from Johnny. Had he executed a little bit better, maybe you don't need to lose your life, but realizing that the Vanish did not have enough bleed to finish off Gunter and walking out of the tower would have resulted in his death regardless. Decides to walk back in, finish off that Agni, and at least turn it into a one-for-one -one trade, pushing Hawk even further ahead, which 
phenomenal, phenomenal start for Hex Mambo's mid laner, of course. 0 1 and 4. Maybe not the prettiest slash line, but it's the resources and a level lead. Starting to look towards that prophetic cloak, things like that. It's going to become even more difficult to shut him down as the game goes on. I'm keeping my eyes on that katana from Johnny. It's almost certainly going to be serrated edge, but with Johnny. I know he's just such a massive fan of the, the Hasten Katana. Maybe he switches things up. Odzix caught out here and will get the CC channeled. He has not gotten to play the game, but I don't, I don't know if they have the damage. They've rotated over and they do have the damage. They take down Big the stun. support, but they've used everything to do it. And Julio is rotated over now from the soul lane. Old Skit channeled on the escape and Johnny is forced to use his as well in a defensive manner. They'll take down the one pick Meanwhile, Spudio looking to push down some XP on this left-hand side. That may open up the objective for the Wargs. Could be. Pyromancer pulled out and burning slowly. Hawks nearby. Might be able to keep it interesting, but won't be working his way into that right side jungle concern, perhaps, by the positioning of Preds. Pluck oh. connects. You okay, Hawk? Play beads, and he will channel the dash just in time, and then stun not there from Gunter. So they use a couple things defensively. They lose out on the ultimate from Johnny. They lose out on the beads from Hawk there. And I, I admittedly, I, I got a little bit worried that that was going to be a real answer back from Hex Mambo. It felt like they had to use everything to take down Kha'Zix right there. And a two-man ultimate from Julio coming in, a, a great rotation, but they're just not able to find any value off that engage. Yeah, good shout on Julio. He gets massive value from his ultimate, not only burning the beads from Rapio, but also getting the ultimate off of Davey means that there could be an opportunity in the near future for Hex Mambo to look for some critical picks. The unfortunate nature of beads off of Rapio is that Rapio will likely have Bat Out of Hell before he sees any action again, and being able to remove yourself from the play field is so valuable. So even if Johnny decides to maybe start the fight with Assassinate, Rapio should be able to displace himself pretty easily. This is a telegraph play. If Kana's this far up, you got to think there's something happening behind it. Kha'Zix has to go to the Fury. He TP'd over, keeping Spudio out, but Julio and Kha'Zix are in between him and his team onto the Gold Fury, and they don't really have the Shred to keep this one. They might have the Shred onto Kana, though, as Rapio finds his way into the back line, forces the Rama ultimate, and now Hawk is into the home sweet home in the back line as well. But Spudio is getting chased down and will be cleaned up by Rapio on the other side of the fight, though. Johnny has arrived! And he will trade out the soul lane or a one for one thus far and low health bars for the wargs but they'll continue to chase on the back of rapio and under the tier one tower he will dive but it's julio has continued to maintain this frontline position everybody finally backs off low health bars for both sides will just be a couple of picks so relic graveyard for the niflheim wargs beads lost from both gunter and davy again creating opportunities for hex mambo Julio has been doing so much for his team, 0-0-2. Not a credit, not accurately depicting how much impact he's had in these fights. But at the end of the day, Sniffleheim Wargs able to reset themselves a little bit healthier back towards this Gold Fury, and they take it with little fanfare. Hex Mambo oh starting to stack up some damage. Gunter dropped low. Hawk's got to be the, the concern point now. If he's allowed to continue farming like this and free casting in the team fights, eventually going to have the damage that he's just going to finish people off on his own. A prophetic Cloak will slow him down a little bit, but additional survivability never hurt anybody. Hex Mambo taking the appropriate route. They lose out on the fight in terms of TKOs. They lose out on the Gold Fury, but they take what they can get. They'll pick up the Stygian Beacon, second one of the game. Both teams now benefiting from that 5% additional structure damage, a little bit of movement speed as well. And importantly, they'll grab the better map state. In fact, now they've taken down the Tier 1 Tower in the left and the Tier 1 Tower in the middle lane, but they don't have the Tier 1 Tower in the right lane, and that is where the Wargs are grouping up. And this signals to me they may be looking to force a fight sooner rather than later. Pyromancer in just over a minute here, just under a minute rather, but everybody backs off. They choose to go back to their farm. I wonder where is the, the next trigger pull? Is it still Wargs that you feel have the reins of this game? Or is now Hex Mambo in, in a position to, to try and force their hand? These compositions are much more evenly matched in the late game state. So generally my, my answer is whoever's got the lead is generally the one that you look to to make anything happen. So I would say the Wargs probably in a better position as of right now to look towards that Pyromancer. You've got 
really good CC from range. Gunter's been doing a great job on this Agni uh, of keeping Johnny at bay for the most part. Johnny kind of working his way forward in the team fight, wants to hold on to the stealth for as long as possible, and Gunter just hunting him down every single time, trying to apply as much poke as possible. I wonder. Is that going to be a blood forge for Johnny in fourth slot? You're really lacking a little bit for, for burst damage if that's the case, but a little bit more alive steal might allow him to stick around in the engagement a bit longer. You've already got it from the serrated edge, and we've seen Johnny find his singular pick pretty consistently. He'll get his one. It's not a whole lot of damage from Johnny, but the cleanup always there. Assassinate such a strong gap close tool that anybody dropped low likely will fall prey to the jungler of Hex Mambo. If it's Blood Forge in that slot of an HP shield afterward, could make him much more powerful in that back line. Pyromancer picked up and Kha'Zix picked up, thrown back to the Wolves as the Wargs will knock him down to half HP, but look at Julio. He has the perfect flank and is setting up for an engage, but he only finds the one set of beads and will back off after the fact. Will just be the Pyromancer going over to the Wargs. Now they've got two Runic Bombs in their pockets. I, I thought Julio was going to go for a much larger engage there with the Lawbringer. Just burns the one set of beads, though. Yeah, I think Julio realizing if he dies there, likely would have lost the Fire Giant. So instead, find what you can with as little cost as possible. And only 60 seconds left on that blink because of the Relic Dagger pickup. Means that beads off of Gunter is just a massive value trade. Two minutes now until he's going to have that CC immunity available to him. So a clear target on his back in the next couple of team fights. Gold has not been separated enough just yet for me to, to really give a vote of confidence to either side on a Fire Giant play. Meaning that I could come down to map state advantage. We've seen Spudio reluctant to leave lane in general, has for the most part just continued sieging down that left-hand side, whereas Davey has been a lot more involved in the PvP. And once more shows presence around the Fire Giant pit. Preds leading the charge, pulling a Kha'Zix. We saw what that did last time. Sending him back to base here might cost you the Fire Giant. So I like the positioning from Kha'Zix. A lot of respect there. If I'm Wargs... Showing positioning, but until the, the, the little effects on map, the, the ring of fire spawns up, Hex Mambo aren't going to be walking in the pit. Yeah, and I wonder really what they're holding on for. I mean, absolutely, you give it to the gold lead and a small one for the wargs for them to sort of be in, in the position of power. But if neither team feels comfortable, you, you know, if they're, if they're in your shoes, right, and they don't really see either one as having a huge advantage, if neither team feels comfortable having that huge advantage, ultimately, c could it come down to, to a coin flip on an objective like this? They're, they're just, they're, there's so much posturing. Yeah, it's just waiting for an unforced error or waiting for an opportunity on map. Maybe Julio finds a, a secondary fearless on Gunter and all of a sudden that opens the door completely or, or Johnny does the exact same, poking and prodding for positioning. That's really all they can do. Yeah, an unforced error may be exactly what they found as Hawk was up a little bit too far. But Gunter is turned on to as well, and Spudio trades the mid laner for mid laner as now Julio finds Huge. a double Fearless onto the tanks, and that leaves Johnny alone with the carries. He'll find one, he'll find two, and it's now Rapio alone versus four as Spudio finds a triple as well. Out of nowhere, the Niflheim works get decided and a hawk for everything that he lost will just trade five for one they're headed towards the fg talk about the wind being knocked out of your sails there frog the niflheim wargs find their free pick what they had been posturing and jockeying for position for the opportunity they had been hunting for the last six minutes presents itself into a free kill on a hawk but an overextension from the entirety of the wargs puts all five members essentially into the enemy purple buff and from there Julio, the machine, finds a two-man fearless, setting up perfectly for Spudio. Johnny makes use of all the commotion to run f havoc in the enemy back line. And Hex and Mambo come out ahead massively. Fire Giant now on all five. Here's your opportunity. Here's your go card. Hex Mambo with Fire Giant on all their teammates. Means they can just go ahead and start sieging in the Niflheim Wargs. The Wargs have got decent base defense. Anytime you've got a standard mage, you got a little bit of difficulty fighting into it. Gunter should be able to poke out the front line of Hex Mambo. Davy's got enhanced range on his auto attacks as well. And with a yellow numbers build, Odysseus Bow will keep those blinks in check. But Hex Mambo don't even necessarily need to get into a Phoenix here. So long as they can knock down two Tier 2s or even grab the beacon, 
would be just fine. Well, the Flying Works, they feel like they still have the advantage. They were the ones that lost that fight just now, but they don't waste any time in pushing up and taking the Oni Fury right out from under. Hex Mama, they catch Johnny back in. He's back in base. They'll grab the Oni Fury, and this will not make sieging easier for the Hex Mambo. But critically, we're now getting around this time, and the third Stygian Beacon has been captured now for Hex Mamba. They are going to have this Fire Giant when these Titans spawn. And looking at the tower damage, I, I think they might spawn in the mid lane as they did last time. Nope, there's a whole, th there's literally a little circle around the left-hand Phoenix that yep. I just didn't, it's right there. I could have yep. just looked. They're going to spawn in the left lane. Mifflin, I feel pretty confident about that. Uh, and I think they may use that to push that down. I think so. And I think they'd be right to do so. Hex Mambo now have got 10% additional structure damage, 2% additional movement speed globally for their team that will not be wearing it off any point. So with the help of their Titan, might be able to leverage the last remaining minute of Fire Giant power play that they've got. Titans unleashed. And now Hex Mambo start to work their way, a slow march to the left side of the map. Niflheim Wargs decided that, you know, with this slow play from Hex Mambo, reset a few times, grab the Pyromancer, that they've got an opportunity to push before the threat is legitimately on their side of the map. So, a tier two trade in the cards here for the Niflheim Wargs, solo for duo. But the difference being that the Titan of the Wargs gonna die before it even makes contact with Hex Mambos. Yeah, they are all the way pushed up just to take down that Titan before anybody gets a chance to push with it. But if they're careful, Niflheim Wargs will use this as an opportunity. Kha'Zix with a beautiful ultimate early to dissuade the push, and it will do exactly as it intended. Gunter and Davey do not get to step See up ya. to the Phoenix, and Preds left alone in the jungle. Johnny will find that pick as well, and now they may look to stop the backs. Johnny, Davey has no idea he might be dead from the bleed, and Johnny and Hawk combine. Three fall now, and Julio and Spudio grab themselves a left side bird and still have their Titan at full HP. They might bring the rest of the team here and try and push. Could be. Maybe you want the Titan to delay a little bit here, not necessarily push it all the way into the enemy Titan room, and instead have it get there as you start to approach that mid Phoenix. It's just Julio trying to buy time, distract the members of the Niflheim Wargs as the rest of Mambo work their way down the center of the map. Mid Phoenix already down to half. Runic Bomb channeled and it will get taken down and now the rest of the team may look to end the game here. Gunter and Rapio oh, Preds all quick. looking to defend, but the Titan is falling fast. It's down to 20% HP. Julio's in on the ultimate and it'll be Hex Mambo who take it in two. Man, the wargs, I love the idea. Keep pressure up on the right side, distract. Your enemies don't allow them to play around that Titan Siege, but they are held in place for too long. Johnny finds a priority pick onto Preds, and from there, a clean team fight win. Didn't even get to have an opportunity to talk about Johnny's build, and he went for a fun one. It was Bumba's Hammer plus Shadow Drinker. He was going to be permanently invisible with infinite CDR, Ooh. but the game ends just before he's allowed to have too much fun with it. Clean stuff, man. This is a team you have to keep your eyes on. We didn't even get a chance. The other Runic Dagger was built by Julio as well. We didn't even get a chance to look at that. It just felt like that last Fire Giant Siege, the Wargs didn't really know how to respond. They put all of, most all of their members on the right-hand side of the map, and then they get picked in the jungle, and then only one person backs. Davey gets picked. Their carry gets picked. It, it just felt like they weren't on the same page. But I think there is at least one critical piece of information or one thing I want to latch onto for this match, and it's that for Hex Mambo, it does not always have to be Johnny. This is a game, I think, that is dictated in large part by Julio. That, that tier performance was phenomenal. He's burning the relics. He's facilitating the back line. He's CCing priority targets. I mean, even on the last siege, distracts two with the Titan by himself. A phenomenal performance from the soul laner. Hex Mambo close it out in two, and with that, they'll be heading towards the main bracket to compete against some of our SPL teams. But that'll, that'll do it for us on the cast. We'll throw it back to J-Mac and Trelly on the desk. A little bit more action-packed to start this game out, Charlie. This time we don't have to wait 19 minutes before we see a first blood. Instead, it's the Wargs and Hex Mambo both getting involved very early throughout this game. Most importantly, kind of keeping Johnny at bay for the Niflheim Wargs yep. to start this one out. 
But unfortunately, they once again fell into the trap of waiting towards late game where Hex Mambo really does shine and become their strongest out there. Got to give more props to Spodio once again this game. His carry play over the course of this week has just been phenomenal. Yep, it seemed like Spodio, there wasn't many answers for him. I do, I do like to highlight what Mifflin was talking about. I think Julio on this tier was being very annoying. It seems like the tier pick has just been extremely dynamic for just about everyone uh, this weekend. Very popular in the solo lane and in particular... Letting, letting Johnny get late game once again proves to be a bit of an issue. There was a few times there where one shot's from Invis, you catch Loki in the jungle, he's going to win that 1v1 trade. And unfortunately, even if you think you're split pushing, you think the enemies are gone, doesn't end up working out. So uh, the Hex Mambo, as Miff said, a team you got to keep your eyes on. And also, picks and bans, something you have to worry about. They have so many different dynamic and priority picks that it seems like you don't know who to focus out. This time they tried to focus out. Johnny didn't work. I don't have the answer for you, but Hex Mambo, feeling pretty good after that one. Yeah, so far we've, we've seen attempted answers at Johnny, take a couple of bands away from him, maybe force him onto something different. So far in his six games, he has played four gods and, and has not had to worry or stray away from what we would consider the, the quintessential Johnny style of picks. We haven't gotten to, or maybe I should say, we haven't needed to see things like the Hebo kind of come out for him just yet. He's been able to play a lot of his standard selections. So once we start moving up towards some of the SPL teams, I then wonder what the SPL does against a, a, a player like Johnny, against a team like Hex Mambu. Do they also try and focus out Johnny? Maybe designate every single ban to this jungle to try and put him on something, or maybe go elsewhere. We'll say the Kuzubo had a decent performance here at least in this first one, able to come out. Not fall too far behind. It was a little bit of a struggle early, a lot of focus towards him, but late game able to get some of those damage numbers online. Didn't really show me the must-ban necessity so far of the Kuzumbo, but still a strong performance here in game two. I mean, I think that's one of Kuzumbo's strength, though. If you're getting focused out, if you're trying to kill the, the supports, which I, I would argue has been the play style for a couple of these teams as of recent, is, hey, let's pick the support first, and then the team fight goes. You pop your two, you reflect all that damage, you get multiple dashes, you're annoying, you're hard to lock down, and because of that, your engage sort of, you know, goes a little bit worse because of how mobile Kuzumbo can be, so uh, I was a fan, but I agree, maybe one of, not one of the must-ban picks up, but hey, still annoying. And we got to see the real cool mechanic of the Titan fighting the Titan in the Titan room this yep. time as opposed to out in the middle of the lane. And with that, the Hex Mambo were able to find themselves a 6-0 for their weekend. They'll get to fight some of the SPL teams a little bit later on this weekend as well. But before we get to move on to there, we do have a post-game interview with Kha'Zix standing by. Thank you so much, J-Mac. That's right, we've got Kha'Zix from the Hex Mambo. Congratulations once again on the win. You guys are now headed up to the main bracket after a quick seeding match. Definitely exciting, and I, I want to get your thoughts on, on game one to start things out, because that was a 33-minute barn burner. I, I don't think you guys got first blood until 17, 18 minutes into the game. It was definitely a slow one. Do you guys feel like that is, is sort of your identity, especially when Johnny picks these slower picks? Are, are you just sort of hesitating and, and, and waiting until you get to that point where you can team fight, as opposed to trying to find invades or early ganks? I mean, if we are able to get early invades, that's very good, but we're very confident in our late game uh, teamfight capabilities, so uh, we're very happy to just wait and uh, let Johnny get six items, and then we know we're going to win the teamfight. So. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right to, to place the confidence there, and I think in, in game two, you guys really embodied that, right? You, they tried to ban Johnny out. They really did. They took away three of his comfort picks. He ends up on Loki, and Miff said it as we were closing things out. The other members stepped up. Jo Johnny obviously had a great game, but Julio was in there on the engages. You had a great game uh, on the Kuzenbo. Even when Johnny doesn't get those comfort picks, I, I mean, is it really a, a full a full team effort, or how does the, how do those team fights come together when you're trying to, especially at the last Phoenix Siege, you guys were kind of splitting the map, and it felt like you were consistently all on the same page. Yeah, I mean, even though Johnny is a very good player and we play around him, we know that every other piece on our team is very good. So, I mean, the only reason we're playing our Johnny is because he's like probably the best player in the world. But we know that every other player on our team is also very good. So it's not like if Johnny's not around, we can't team fight. Um, so like the fact that we're good at team fighting is not just because of him, but a, a, lot, a large bit of it is because of him. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's hard not to rely on uh, on one of the best junglers down there in the SCC. Looking forward, last question for you. You guys are now headed definitely towards that upper bracket, but you're going to have a seeding matchup potentially versus the Wargs again or versus these other two teams playing in the lower bracket, the Valkyries going up against the Sages. After getting a chance to, to look at all of these teams, NA and EU, who do you expect to, to be up there with you in the SPL or Caliber bracket? I think it's fairly likely that we'll end up playing Wargs. 
so probably them. Uh, but if not them, I, I think maybe Valks are back on it now. They played pretty well earlier today. Well, you heard it here. EU dominance potential to continue there from Kha'Zix. Once again, Hex Mamba, congratulations on the win. We'll throw it back to the desk. Yeah, that's right. Hex Mamba on a tear so far this week. Remember, 6-0 across their three sets that they have played. And still, as mentioned, a seeding match to play up against the winner that makes their way through the lower bracket to then try and play into a seed to see if they face off against the Gladiators, if they face off against the Eldritch Hounds a little bit later on in this weekend. Then we can take a look at the bracket to see how at least the lower end of it will now pan out and how things are shaping up for it. Niflheim Wargs now waiting for the loser of, or I should say the winner of the Athenian Sages and the Valhalla Valkyries in the loser's bracket there. Another best of three between the Sages and the Valks will be happening after this match here. And then tomorrow is when things will really start to kick out. We'll have the Wargs jump in. They'll have their opposition. Hex Mamba will be waiting for the winner of that one to play into that seeding match to see which, two of the, which of those two teams will be moving up into the next tier of the bracket against some of the SPL teams, which ones will be facing the Hounds, the Gladiators, and then moving in towards those quarterfinals as well, which, if not mistaken, quarterfinals do begin tomorrow because we've only got two matchups left in this bracket in particular after today would be done. And then we'll jump into some quarterfinals tomorrow, have some more quarterfinals as well, moving in over towards Sunday. So a very, or a very fun bracket still to be had between there. We'll finally get some introductions into the SPL teams to see how they can face off against each other on this new meta. I'm very excited to see what some of the SPL talent has. But so far from what we've been seeing out of the SCC, a lot of still stuff that, that's fairly standard from what we had from 10.5 and a couple of new little pop-ups coming through here, Trelly. Yeah, I do hope that we get to see even more switch-ups to the meta, right? Because, oh, yeah. you know, once we get to finally see these SPL players on this client, should be a fun time. But We've already seen so much variety, and I think that has been a big deal, just not knowing exactly what these top meta picks are. Sure, there's going to be some flavor of the month stuff that these teams just you know, feel like they're very comfortable on, but there's been a lot popping up, and I imagine it's only going to continue. Yeah, we still got a whole weekend of Smite to go, and we still have one more set to go as well, so make sure you stick around. we got the Valkyries and the Sages coming up next.